Welcome, Harry. Thanks for being our leadoff guest today. How are you today? Good. How are you doing? Thanks for having me. Very good. No, we're excited to, to lead off, to dive right in with your keynote of sorts here. As I mentioned in the intro, I've been following your work for some time. We've, we've worked together on a couple of these related projects. But before we get into the meat of your research and what it tells you about this field and what it tells you about 2020, why don't you just tell our viewers a little bit about you, your background, how you got to become interested in this line of work? Yeah, well, I actually have a slide about this, so that'll speed things up once I get started. But um, for those who don't know me, I guess I, I'm uh, my initial, my main research, my technical work is in uh, probability theory and statistics, and uh, particularly in network modeling and in um, study of stochastic processes. So, um, on the technical, you know, the te technical side, things are um, I've mostly worked in the mathematical. Uh, analysis of uh, certain probability models. Uh, but another thing that is important to me and that I've uh, become more and more uh, focused on in recent years is on the um, understanding of probability situations and where, where kind of the technical analysis can help us to understand things, but also what its limitations are. Uh, and one of those circumstances, or you know, one of the particular contexts that I've looked to uh, to gain insights uh, about how the about what the distinction is between, say, uh, some of the more technical or theoretical things and the more practical side is in um, the study of prediction markets and in particular uh, political forecasting. So that's something that I got into in the past within the past couple of years, and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, today. I don't hear you. I can't hear you. Sorry, I had muted myself. Can you get me now? Yeah. Great. I was just saying your work has, has really fascinated me and a lot of people who follow these markets and these forecasters, in part because of just, I think, sort of the meta nature of it. I mean, you, you provide sort of a scorecard uh, for uh, forecasters and various forecasting methods. So it almost enables those of us in this field to predict the predictors. And it's, it's a, a really nice way of kind of holding everyone's feet to the fire and uh, providing a, some kind of a quantitative benchmark that we can look at over time to really determine, you know, who's got the goods, who can actually provide a unique insight here, who can provide some kind of a uh, beyond what the conventional wisdom is showing us and, and being able to, to have kind of a universal yardstick to say how good are these folks compared with one another and compared with different forecasting methods is, uh, is really unique and invaluable. So I mean, with that as context, can you, can you jump into a little bit, uh, you know, I mentioned in, in, in the introduction up top that you did uh, quite a bit of study on the 2018 cycle and are now embarking on it in a larger way in 2020. But can you tell us a little bit about just what your overall method was, how you go about scoring, grading, comparing uh, different forecasters and methods? Well, the, the method, and I'll, I'll get into some of the specifics uh, later, but the, the, the basic method that, that I'm uh, working off of, or the basic rationale is, um, we have, on the one hand, we have forecasts coming from all different sources, but the one I focus on is 538, which is usually thought is the most, probably the most popular and considered to be probably the best among, among that group of pundits and journalists. Um, and then you have the prediction markets on the other side, um, where you actually have people putting up real money and you know risking their risking money based on what they believe is going to happen. So um, it seems like most of the time people groups are t talked about or, or kind of judged on separate grounds, and it seemed to make sense to me that if we wanted to get a, a if we wanted to get an idea of how valuable the so-called experts or the the um, the 538 forecasts are. Uh, you know, or how, how better, how much better or worse they are than the prediction markets that we should maybe put or think about, you know, what it would have been like if you were to uh, employ some kind of investing or betting strategy based on the 538 forecasts and buying or selling, depending on how those forecasts deviate or how the market prices deviate from this. And so um, that was what I, something I started uh, to look into in the 2018 midterm. Um, and the results were a bit mixed uh, in, in, in part of, in some of it, it seemed that the, the, the uh, prediction markets came out ahead and in other parts uh, they didn't. Um, and so what I wanted to do for 2020 is to start this uh, a lot sooner and to try to um, get maybe a little bit more of an in-depth and more detailed analysis 
where we can follow it from the very beginning, because I actually started that analysis in 2018, just a couple of weeks before the, uh, before the election. So now we're ramping things up, starting to look at things already, and we want to actually be able to follow how, how the trading would, would go in this dynamic fashion, you know, basis if you were to trade from the very beginning of the cycle through the very end. Right. And so I want to get into 2020 in a minute, but, but let's uh, back up for just a second and talk about the 28. You said the results were a little bit mixed and you also alluded to sort of a simulated betting strategy that you employed, I guess, to sort of put the 538 forecast to the test. Uh, you know, hypothetically, were, were those um, forecasts to be used to employ a trading strategy on a market like Predict It? Assuming that was the method that you used, can you describe exactly how you you implement that and how you know what those mixed results in 2018 looked like? Um, yeah, I can. I mean, I have slides for this. Um, sure, you, for, yeah. If you can share your screen, that would be great. Share them now or um, whenever's good for you. Yeah, if you're ready to do that, let's let's have a look. The title that Flip mentioned is Models versus Markets, and I'll be talking about that. But I'll also be talking about uh, how this um, project of mine fits into a uh, larger context of something that I've, of things that I think about regularly, not just in terms of uh, prediction markets, but uh, also just generally in, in terms of my interest as, uh, as far as uh, just the study of probability and statistical modeling is concerned. So uh, I already went through some of the brief introduction of myself where uh, my primary area of research has been in the modeling of networks and understanding complex systems. Um, main focus being probability, stochastic processes, and statistical modeling. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the, that technical work at all today. Today, my focus is going to be on the, um, some of the broader questions that arise uh, in trying to bring those technical ideas into a real world context to better understand uh, and well, to better understand things that are happening and also to make better decisions, particularly under uh uncertain well decisions under uncertainty but also to know the limitations of some of these technical methods and there's a lot of there, there are a lot of contexts in which this is this this is important of course finance uh, any kind of financial or gambling or risk-taking scenario which is one of my primary interests um primary you can call it applied interest and one of my initial interests in studying probability um, and today in talking about um, prediction markets kind of fits kind of perfectly into that uh, for reasons that I will uh, discuss. I also wanted to take a minute to kind of highlight a related initiative of mine called Researchers, Researchers One, which is a, a website, it's a, it's a publishing platform. Uh, you can go to the website, www.researchers.one and check it out for yourself. But, the idea behind this, and for those of you who are out there who have any academic or publishing research type experience, you'll, you'll know a little bit more about what I'm talking about. You have your own experiences um, to, to go off of. Uh, but for, for, for various reasons, the kind of the, uh, in, in my opinion, in the opinion of many, the, the kind of the existing infrastructure out there for publishing scientific work is suboptimal for a number of reasons. And what researchers want is attempting to do is to provide a, an open access and a very a more transparent uh, kind of platform that hopes to kind of get rid of or to kind of cut through the noise and to provide a more robust, uh, a more robust kind of scientific and public uh, peer review process uh, so that maybe the signal that you get or the, or the, the, the um shouldn't say not not value but the trustworthiness of the literature uh can be increased and somehow i, I feel that this is very closely tied to uh what what many of you are already interested or are doing in your study of prediction markets where in that case we have a in some sense a decentralized system where there's a lot of noise anybody can come in and put money into the market based on their opinion. But the fact that in some sense, nobody is, nobody, no, no one person in the market trusts any other person in the market. It's all about kind of skept, being skeptical and um, trying to cut through what, you know, what's, what's signal and what's noise uh, somehow arrives at what we hope is a more reliable market signal. 
uh, for whether it's for policy or other things that prediction markets are used for. So I would just invite you to check that out as I think some, a lot of the ideas are um, any guiding philosophy is uh, very similar. Uh, there's some references here and I'll have these on a later slide um, just to, uh, in case you wanna look at this further, I'll talk specifically about the project on models versus markets, this project that I started in 2018 and started thinking about how to um, understand um, how prediction markets compare to other types of other types of forecasting such as polls and punditry uh, but a lot of this actually for me is really just a specific application of a lot of important and interesting ideas in a much broader context where probability uh, some fundamental ideas about probability come up and those are uh, things that I would um, that I'll talk about a bit here in particular, the second, the fourth reference here that the called the fundamental principle of probability is something that uh, I think is uh, particularly relevant here. Okay. Okay. So just to um, give kind of a high, high level overview, I'm going to get to the uh, political, the prediction market stuff towards the middle and the end of this. Uh, but to set the stage a bit, I mentioned that my, my research is primarily in probability theory and mathematical statistics, mathematical probability. But what I'm trying to understand here is how, how those ideas relate to a real world context. And when, when these things are brought into a real world context, there are a lot of other considerations that come into play beyond simply, you know, setting up a model and seeing what it says and then, you know, just doing some math. Uh, there are, uh, the major considerations that I'll focus on here and that I think are important um, more generally, are, there are ethical considerations, practical considerations, conceptual ones, and I think all of them are, um, all of them can be highlighted and somehow can be captured very well within the uh, prediction market framework. Um, and I'm going to talk about that, um, talk about that throughout, but just to highlight that, I'm going to focus these on what I consider to be three core principles of real world probability and I'll highlight these as the fundamental principles of probability of modeling and of gambling and how these apply in the context of prediction markets. So um, what I'm calling and, and actually I, I should I'll I should say that a lot of these ideas even though they apply beyond political prediction markets these ideas have developed for me since I started to study and think harder about uh, the political, the predictions, the election forecast within the context of the 2016 uh, election. And I'll, I'll mention that in one or two slides. So what, what are these things? I mean, these, the, so I have a paper that I mentioned earlier that I called the fundamental principle of probability. And all, all this is to me is uh, the idea that if you, if you, or if anyone, if somebody, you know, forecasts something, if they give a probability, if they quote a probability on a certain outcome, then they're somehow bound to accept a bet at, a bet on that on that outcome at any odds which would be favorable relative to the probability. So, uh, what I mean by that is, if I if I say that something is sixty percent, and you offered me even money, then according to my forecast of sixty percent, even money would be a good would be favorable odds, and so I should take that bet. And if I'm not willing to take that bet, then there's something, there's some kind of discrepancy in what I meant when I said 60%, or maybe, you know, somehow I, I either wasn't serious or I wasn't being genuine about it. Um, and the only way that I, that I can think, and there's this interesting thing about probability is that there's somehow a very concrete mechanism automatically embedded into the concept of probability, which allows us to elicit whether or not somebody is being honest or genuine in the uh, the reporting of their beliefs via probability, and it's through this uh, through this principle. And so, of course, this is something that is inherent to prediction markets. That if you if 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 I were a trader in a market and I had a belief that something had a sixty percent chance, then the market was offering me fifty, uh, allowing me to buy it at fifty cents, then I would be certainly willing to do that. All other, all other things being equal, of course, in practice, there are things I'm going to ignore, practical things like obviously transaction costs are a real thing, time value of money, opportunity costs, and things like that. 
But this is something that if you compare it to how political pundits are typically evaluated in markets, they typically face no consequences for either hedging their reputation or hedging what they say uh, or for having post hoc adjustments or to, to what they actually predicted or for using certain vague language to try to describe uh, you know, what they mean. And we'll see some examples of that later. The second thing, uh, the second principle of modeling, which gets, which is related to, you know, kind of everything that I study uh, elsewhere in terms of um, statistical modeling and anyone who's out there who's ever built a model for, whether it's for prediction markets or political predictions or sports betting or finance or anything like that knows that it's very easy to be fooled by a model. It's very easy to convince it's, it's easy to convince ourselves, or it's easy, it's easy for me to convince myself that before I, before, I, um, before I fit the model, of course, everything in the model makes perfect sense to me. I think that that's exactly how the situation should behave. And so then I expect that when I fit the model to the data that uh, somehow everything, that it, it'll give me the insights that I need. But in reality, once I have a model and I go to a market and the market disagrees with my model, then that's automatically a suggestion that there must have been something wrong with my model. Uh, and when, we're, when you're dealing in a prediction market or in a risk-based context, those discrepancies can't be ignored in the same way that they can be when we can just explain them away, whether it's in a scientific paper or in the media, uh, blaming a bad prediction on bad data or bad polling or as Nate Silver has been doing for four, at least four years, almost four years, is uh, to blame it on uh, the James Comey reopening the investigation a couple weeks before uh, the election. Of course, if you had a strong model, that uncertainty and the possibility that Comey did, would do that would have somehow been incorporated into it. Um, but of course, that's impossible to do in practice to account for all of these things all at once. And finally, uh, what, what I call the fundamental principle of gambling, when, when we're involved in any kind of gambling context, we, um, we don't want to get arbitraged or free rolled. Uh, it, we might lose a bet, but we shouldn't be losing it in such a way that we shouldn't be betting in a way that prevents us from winning no matter what happens. And actually, a lot of, a lot of the ways in which um, political punditry is done is done in such a way that no matter what happens, the the pundit is able to kind of wiggle out of it. Whereas if, if their prediction is correct, they win. And if their prediction is wrong, they can somehow, uh, that will they face no consequences. And so in that sense, uh, that's a free roll. So I think that these are three principles that I think are important. Um, and I think they're also principles that are easily, very much amenable with the prediction market framework and which actually are in many ways addressed through uh, political prediction markets. Okay, so when I, uh, what, what got me starting to think about the, the things on the previous slide and more generally how we can, how, how I should think about probability and forecasting in a real world context, a lot of this started in the uh, lead up to the 2016 election. Prior to that, I actually thought very little about um, politics and political predictions at all, I, I had very little under, um, familiarity with 538 or uh, prediction markets at that time. Um, but what, what caught my attention at that time was that, um, so I'm, I'm in a university, so most of the people I, I'm around on a daily basis, or at least the people who talk about these things, tend to be, um, well, tend to probably be on the liberal side and are anti, or anti-Trump at the time, just to say that. So the conversations that I, I, I was hearing, I guess in the months leading up to the election, you know, 538 might have Trump at 25%. And somebody, I would hear people say, oh, that's, I'm concerned. His chance of winning is 25%. That's too high. And then something else would happen is his probability, his forecast would go down to 10%. And they would say, oh, I feel, I'm feeling a lot better now. Then the first debate happened. And I guess, Trump, you know, Trump did a lot better than people expected. And I believe 538's number went up to 35 or 40% on that day. And people started to freak out again. And so what I was, what I was um, watching here uh, and what, what I found very interesting about this was that 
in principle, there's supposed to be some kind of real world thing happening. And, you know, the, the debate is a real world event and that may or may not have um, increased uh, Trump's chances of, of winning the election. But the, the, the question really was, how does this number, this forecast that's changing on a very regular basis on uh, the 538 website connect to that reality, which is who's actually going to win the election? And it seemed to change so drastically on such a regular basis that it was hard for me to come up with any kind of uh, understanding of what these numbers actually meant. Um, typically, you know, there's ways to think about probabilities in terms of frequencies, but when we think about a prediction of a one-off event, there's no frequency to talk about. It'll either happen or it won't. Um, another way is in terms of betting odds. And, but in this, in this particular case, uh, the 538, as far as I know, and I'm pretty sure they're not uh, putting any bets on these on. And so if I can't interpret them as any, either of those two things, how am I supposed to understand what these um, what these forecasts mean? And so I started to uh, so that kind of led me to try to think. Well, one, how do I make sense of these forecasts? And in particular, you know, really, what's the value of this expert opinion? What is the linkage between this forecast on the website and the actual event that I'm interested in uh, predicting, which is the outcome of the election? Uh, so this is just a this. This brings us forward to about 2018, and this is just a, a snapshot or a screenshot of, a, of, of the New Jersey Senate race a couple of weeks before the, um, the 2018 midterm. There's nothing remarkable about this particular uh, race. It just happens to be what I have a screenshot of from that period of time. Uh, but it, it, but what, what, so here, about a week or two before the election, uh, 538 gave Bob Menendez, who was a Democrat, incumbent a 90, 90% chance of re winning re-election. Uh, on that same day, predicted gave him a 78% chance. And so um, the question, of course, is, well, those are pretty, that's a pretty big difference. Um, which of the two is, which of the two is right? Which is more accurate? Which one should I look to or, or should I trust? And of course, in this particular case, we can look back and see that, um, well, Bob Menendez actually won re-election. So uh, in this particular case, the 90% was turned out to be closer to reality, um, but can't really tell anything from one race in particular, from one race. Uh, but you know, the question is, well, this is a huge discrepancy. If, you're, um, if the 538 estimate is right, then the market's offering something like a 12% or even higher edge to bet on Menendez, which even at the pretty exorbitant commissions that you get and predict it, that would be a, uh, that would be a good bet to make. And it's a little, it's, it's a bit curious that um, the markets aren't responding to this number. I'm sure the traders on predict it are well aware of the 538 forecast and probably use them in their models in one, one way or another. Um, but it must be that the markets are incorporating some kind of information that's not in the, in the, for some reason, they're not they're they're not trusting the 538 number fully, um, and so which of these numbers should I trust? Well, given the discrepancy, either the markets must be very inefficient, and there are probably inefficiencies for sure in the in the predicted markets, but they're probably not this inefficient, this close to an election, um, or the 538 estimates are unreliable, maybe both. Um, but of course. If I think about this conceptually, I would expect that the markets are more accurate uh, because the people in the markets have more to gain, also more to lose uh, from being wrong. And actually, you know, when, when especially the, for the professionals in these markets, the difference between a 78 percent, a 78 cent contract and an 81 cent contract is the difference between a buy or a sell, possibly. Whereas the difference between a 78% forecast or an 80, 81% forecast on, on 538 isn't really going to get interpreted qualitatively uh, as very different. And so there is an obvious incentive that the markets need to be much sharper and much more precise. And so that, that, that's kind of a hypothesis, but the question then becomes, um, is, is that... Uh, 
is that is that right? Are the markets actually more accurate? So this gets to the project that Flip mentioned and that I'm going to talk about um, that I want to highlight here. So uh, I already talked about the fundamental principle of probability, and it relates to this setting exactly because it raises the question of, well, what if, I mean, if this discrepancy is real and if the 538 forecasts are so much, are, are actually better than the markets, then and there's a lot of money to be made by putting money, by betting money into these markets as a, by just going for the 538 forecast. Uh, even though there's an $850 cap when predict it and things like that. I mean, you could imagine how many people work at 538. They could all open up accounts and, you know, eventually those, those $850 contracts at 12% edge, uh, that'll add up pretty fast, uh, especially over all the markets that are available. Um, and so I wanted to test out this uh, fundamental principle and just observing, of course, that it's a principle that's violated almost everywhere. It's certainly violated in the uh, in election forecasting, particularly in the 538 predictions. They don't actually put money where their mouth is as far as the forecasting is concerned in any direct sense. Uh, they, don't, they, don't, they aren't invested in, in the prediction markets. Um, it's also true of science in, uh, there's something called the replication crisis where statistical, statistical analysis probabilities are used all the time to justify, uh, either bogus or unreliable scientific conclusions. And there's no consequences for, for those, uh, for those mistakes and, and in other places as well in finance elsewhere and gambling and pretty much, um, anywhere you look that anywhere you look that there's some kind of risk or some kind of uncertainty, it, it, there tends to be an asymmetry uh, available. And the idea behind this principle is that, that to get rid of that asymmetry. Okay. So the, the objective is to, um, so on the converse, um, here's what actually happens, which is that the, the thing that kind of, I guess, draws my attention and, bothers me a bit to say to say the least with how the 538 and other kinds of um we'll say journalistic forecasts are made is that they have a quantitative component associated to them which is the, the probabilities they give but they also have this what they call journalistic this journalism component where they write articles to explain the numbers and it's in those articles that a lot of the what really what I call snake oil uh, salesmanship is where that's happening. And, and this is kind of very, very prominent, I think, in the 538 headlines. Uh, so I just highlighted a headline. This is from the, uh, this is from the morning of the 2016 election. And uh, this is an article by Nate Silver. Uh, so all of the, all of the, or for the most part, 90% of the headlines that I come across on 538 have this same kind of structure to them, which is they pretty much cover 100% of the possibilities. And this is no, no exception here. So the final election update is that there's a wide range of outcomes and most of them come up Clinton. So on the one hand, there's a wide range of outcomes. Anything can happen. Um, most of them come up, but most of them come up Clinton. So I'm, if Clinton wins, I'm going to, you know, I predicted that, but if, if Clinton doesn't win, there was a wide range of outcomes, anything was possible. And then later in the article, to try to explain, you know, why the, all the reasons why the prediction might be wrong, uh, there's another headline, which is polling errors are correlated across states and could put Clinton at risk or put red states in play. So there are polling errors, they're correlated, uh, and they could either mean that Clinton wins or Clinton loses. So either way, um, there's an excuse for why the prediction was wrong, could be polling errors, and polling errors can be responsible one way or the other. Of course, there's, some, there's an extent to which these statements are kind of true, but there's also kind of an extent to which they're, they're, they're kind of meaningless or they're vacuous because they cover all of the bases. Uh, and so it's kind of because of this that after the election happens, with no clear metric for how to grade, the bet, for how to grade these forecasts, we have uh, of course, there's people who come out afterwards and say the forecasts were wrong, but then there's plenty of people who say the forecasts were right. And this is an example from a group of statisticians. And they say, uh, once again, Nate Silver got it right um, on the basis that essentially 
he gave 28% to Trump and 28% is bigger than zero. And it's, you know, a a reasonable probability. So it certainly was reasonable that Trump could have won. Um, Another thing that I should point out that in contrast to my uh, fundamental principle of probability, Silver was actually asked before the 2018 midterms whether or not he was invested in the prediction markets. And he said that he couldn't be invested because of ethical reasons. So in other words, for him, it's unethical to be in, involved in the prediction markets, whereas uh, I would argue that it's, it's the opposite. Okay. So, um, okay. So the, I'll try to move relatively quickly through these next few slides, just because I know we're a little bit behind for, um, due to earlier. Flip, if at any point you, you want me to speed things up or whatever, no, just let me know. No, that's all right. You know, I'll keep an eye for when, um, when our next panelist, Dr. Bittekoffer, comes in. And uh, maybe we'll go a couple minutes past two and then just jump straight into her. But, you know, looking at the clock, okay. we're, we're just a few minutes before two o'clock now. So uh, be, be mindful of the clock. But I know we, we started a little bit uh, after the hour and, and we had the tech issue. So I don't want to cut you off. Uh, okay, so no problem. Please, go yeah, ahead. Thanks. All right. So... Um, the, j- just to give a little bit of background, there are some typical metrics out there for um, evaluating forecasters. Uh, two, the two most well-known, one, widely used ones, are one's called calibration, the other's called accuracy, and the one that I want to use is grading against profit and loss in the actual prediction markets. So roughly speaking, um, so I'll describe why I don't want to use these, or these top two uh, before going on to the last one. So just to give you a quick, quick background, uh, what calibration means, if you're not familiar with it, is just that a, a forecaster is calibrated if, my, if, if all of my 10%, if, if my 10% forecasts happen about 10% of the time. So when I say that one particular event has a 10% probability, of course the outcome will either happen or it won't. You can't judge how good I was necessarily on that one event. But if you look over a large series of uh, forecasts, if I say 10% of the 10%, those 10% events should happen about 10% of the time. Uh, the problem with, and this is actually the first uh, metric that is referenced in, um, for example, so in Nate Silver's book, he talks about this, he also talked about this uh, before the 2018 election, saying that this is how his forecast should be graded. Uh, the problem with calibration, though, is that it, it's easy to be calibrated with having, without having any predictive value whatsoever. If I assign, if, if, if we're, we're talking about Clinton and Trump, and I say 50% Clinton, 50% Trump, well, at least exactly one of them are guaranteed to win before the, elect, before the election even takes place. And so one will win, one will lose. I will have said one, I, will, I said both of them had a 50% chance. So exactly one out of two of of my 50% predictions happened. Uh, and so I would be perfectly calibrated, even though uh, I've said nothing about who's, I've, I've given no actual insight into the, into the outcome. Uh, in fact, I know that I'll be perfectly calibrated before the event even happens. Uh, so that's how you know that it's not a, a very worthwhile metric. There's a more sophisticated way to achieve defensive forecast, to, to, to achieve calibration called defensive forecasting. Uh, which I won't get into, but basically it allows me to guarantee that I'll be calibrated in the long run just by overcorrecting for my past deviations from calibration and without having any idea about what's going to happen in the future. So I wrote wrote about that in my paper, uh, and I won't focus on it here, but I just wanted to point out that calibration on its own is not a very informative metric. Uh, a A bit better is something called accuracy, which is uh, a way of grading how close the forecasts are to the actual outcomes. Uh, so if I have a forecast PI and I look at the outcome as either being zero or one, then I can assign a score. And in this case, I'm, something called the Breyer score is uh, just taking the sum of the squared deviations of my forecast from the, um, from the actual outcome. And I wanted to take a minute to show you um, if I can, that the that you can actually go to uh, 538. They do actually have um, they do actually have uh, some 
So they do actually have a part of their website dedicated to evaluating how good their forecasts are. And if you go down here, uh, they, show, they show their Briar score for all of these different types of um, events. So here, these are sporting events, the yellow and the purple are political events. And they're comparing this, what they call an unskilled forecast, which they believe, which they say is basically someone who just uses the long-term uh, averages uh, to, do, to do a prediction. And they show that all of their forecasts do better than this so-called unskilled forecast. You can see they, they don't do very good in baseball. Actually, their sports, their sports are really bad um, in general. But in politics, they actually do, well, by this metric, they, they, they claim to do pretty good. Uh, there's a little bit of fine print. I'd have to, you'd have to dig into it a bit more to actually evaluate the, uh, how, what these scores actually mean. But there's a bit of fine print here. Um, talking about, of course, in an election, they have a prediction. They have a new forecast pretty much every single day and then multiple times a day as the election comes up. So which of these many forecasts are they using? And they have something here that explains how they do that. But um, it's not necessarily clear that we should, uh, that that's the, the, the right way to do it. Anyway, I'm not going to delve into that here. I'm just going to point out that they do have this Breyer score and they do claim to do a pretty good job according to the Breyer score. Okay. So, so Harry, I'm sorry to interrupt, but just in the interest of time with that as very good and thorough context, do you mind yes. maybe uh, skipping ahead a little bit to, to give us your more comprehensive evaluation of how they should be scored and how they, yes. how they fare upon that scoring? Okay. So thank you. So, um, so that's what they've, so that's what they've done. And, Here's, here's my, my proposal is to take, take all, take the forecast. So compare the forecasts. Um, so why is that not necessarily very informative? One is that they're comparing it against what they call an unskilled forecast. I'd prefer to, to compare it to a skilled forecast. And it's not clear that they're taking the uh, dynamics of this process into, into account. And so um, a better way to do it and the way that I propose to do it is to imagine that, um, so the basic method is to imagine that we were going to take the 538 forecast, we were going to, we were going to uh, bet into the prediction market on a daily basis. Every morning we wake up, we see the deviation, we see how, what the prices are, we see what the forecasts are, and we either buy yes or we buy no according to how the market uh, looks compared to our forecast. And so that's what I did according to the, um, that's what I did in the 2018 cycle. And the, the, the initial results for that are uh, shown in this table. And so I mentioned at the beginning that there were some mixed results. And what I mean by that is that in the Senate races, uh, the predicted, uh, predicted did much better. So 538 lost. Uh, and in the House races, 538 did better than predicted. Uh, so it, it's a bit of a mixed bag. And this threshold here, in the interest of time, I won't get into that, but it's, it's trying to take into account the fact that it's pretty much well known that the, for, for very remote events, for, for a 99% chance, predict it tends to have prices that are much less than 99, maybe 97, 96. And so on these events, 538 would really be able to clean up in theory. Uh, but in practice, it's not really worth it for transaction cost reasons and things like that. Um, so that's just trying to account for the fact that 538's main edge would probably be kind of artificial uh, because of some of the inefficiencies that are known to exist in these markets. Uh, looking forward, I, I had something here just to, just to point out, I won't spend a lot of time on it, that Nate Silver actually did respond to this analysis. He called it very cherry-picked um, and that I'm ignoring the overall house odds where predict it was way off and where we would have bet a huge amount of money and was the source of most of our criticism. And we wouldn't have advanced blindly making all these bets. In some cases, markets have an intel that we'd consider relevant, but isn't in our model. So basically he's saying that for the, for the house races where he already knows he made money, he would have won. He would have bet big on those. And for the Senate races, he wouldn't. Um, but this is all after the fact analysis. And I should just point out, uh, 
I guess it was probably flip, but the American Civics Exchange chimed in here to kind of point at some of the uh, some of the inconsistencies in what Silver said before the election and what he was saying here uh, in defense of his uh, performance in these particular markets. Okay, so final two slides here. Uh, this is really just to foreshadow 2020. So for 2020, we're going to try to do the same analysis, but we're going to do it in real time. So the the analysis I did in 2018 was really just taken from uh, a couple of days before the election. Imagine that you buy yes or no and you uh, and see how it does after election day. But now we're going to we're, we're getting started already and we are um, going to imagine that we were actually buying and selling yes and no contracts on a daily basis based on the 538 number versus the predicted number. And we're going to see how those how that trading strategy would would work out. Uh, if it was if it was conducted in real time, and so this is uh, this is something that I'm working on with a student, Darian Vincent, who is who created an app for this, uh, and I can just give you a quick um, quick peek at that, and then we'll we'll have we'll be able to finish um, at that point. So uh, we have a so he's created this this app. Uh, which, which right now there, there might be some some mistakes in some of the calculations. We're still kind of working out the the bugs, but th these are the numbers from the 2020 Democratic primary, and according to these numbers, uh, the 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 pre if it, 538 would have made a little bit of money, or well, maybe a good amount of money in the Democratic primary if it were playing the prediction markets during this time. Of course, it's really only one set of races. And there's, there's a good reason for that. Uh, there's a few reasons for that. One is that uh, 538 was always more, uh, more bullish on Biden and than the prediction markets and Biden ended up uh, winning most of these states in the later case. So he, he they would have made more money there. And also there, is, there are some uh, things that are hard for us to account for like, uh, like the kind of the market inefficiencies and also the, the full order book isn't something that's available to us. So there are some, there are some things in here that make it look slightly more beneficial to 538. But overall, I believe the main reason for it was that uh, Biden happened to win. And that was something that definitely um, 538 was more uh, optimistic about. Okay, so just to um, conclude there, I will, I will conclude with um, just saying that we're gonna continue to update this app throughout the cycle so you can check it out um, and it looks like I oh last thing to say is that political prediction markets um, I believe moral of the story is are there a way to elicit insights insights in line with the fundamental principles that I outlined at the beginning um, the question is so that they I believe they're more principled but are they more accurate and that's something that uh, we'll be studying throughout the uh, election cycle, and you can stay tuned to the, the updates to our website and to this app um, to, to see how they go throughout the process. So thanks for your attention. Thanks for listening. And um, I take any questions if there's time. Otherwise, if not, uh, you can always email me or contact me on Twitter or anything like that. Yeah. That's Thank great. Thank, thanks so much, Harry. And yeah in just a moment, uh, move on to our next session, just in the interest of time. But uh, we do have your uh, Twitter handle and some of our materials, and we'll certainly uh, annotate that with email address, the, the web address of that app, which looks really interesting too, so people can follow along with your work. Um, really is such a fan of what you're doing and, and certainly not lost on me is the irony that it takes an academic to force the journalist to finally reckon with the real world and put these uh, forecasts to the tests, or you're doing it uh, on his behalf if, if, if he's unwilling to do so. Um, it, thanks so much again, Harry. And if you wouldn't mind making a copy of these slides available too, we can link to those so people can pour over them in, in some greater detail. Okay, sure, no problem. Thanks a lot, Flip. Thanks.